Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Um, uh, we are um, Ronak Carlo from Rakuten. Um, Rakuten is this big Japanese company that started out in 1999. Um, it's, um, it has been expanding globally over the last uh, 15 years. Um, it has a lot of services, um, but it mostly focuses on e-commerce. And it has acquired many companies around the world during these years. Um, you might know eBay and Viber, probably. Um, we are here to talk today about our experience with Cloud Foundry over the last five years. Uh, so we will start with that, and then we will focus on what we are doing right now to update our deployment and, uh, and what we plan to do in, uh, in the future, in the next uh, few years, at least. So let's start with actually um, describing what we do with our Cloud Foundry deployment. Um, it's an internal uh, platform as a service for our developers. Uh, we actually presented this platform already a few years back here at the CF Summit in 2013 um, because at the time we had just forked the platform to implement some of the features that were required in Rakuten. Um, some of them actually in the years were implemented in V2 as well, in what would become V2 eventually. Some of them were never accepted and uh, to support the, these use cases we actually had to keep diverging from the uh, V2 uh, development branch. So um, we, uh, this allows, uh, allowed us to actually uh, reach quite a sizable um, deployment. Uh, we, at a certain time, we were probably like the second biggest um, V1 deployment in the world. Um, all of this it has been running for five years with a team of seven people doing pretty much everything, handling from user support to operations to development, architecture, everything. In these years, we learned a, quite a sizable amount of stuff uh, about what is good to do with this platform and what is not good to do. Uh, the first thing is don't try to make everything fit in. Uh, sometimes application will have unique requirements, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes not. Uh, don't yield to the, oh my, snowflake is so unique, you need to support it, narrative. Uh, in most cases, it's the application that needs to be adapted to the platform, not the other way around. Getting a good corporate champion to back you up is actually very, very important to make sure that this goes the, the right way. Otherwise, what might, have, might happen is that you end up forking. And we learned the hard way that it's not a very good idea because there is too much value in what the community is doing, too much momentum. Don't ever think about doing that. Um, try to build everything that you need to build either on top or on the side. If you're building on top, try to keep things uh, as neat and lean as possible. Try to stick to public APIs in, so that things will not break even long term. Um, another thing, obvious somewhat is that engineering time does not scale. Uh, every single thing that you leave behind, every single manual step that you have to do uh, in the long term is going to come and actually bite you. So don't yield to the temptation of turning your cattle into pets, basically, uh, because this really, really, really doesn't scale. And you end up with uh, snowflakes everywhere that are not good. Uh, this doesn't just apply to provisioning. This applies even more importantly to the way you l collect, aggregate, store logs and metrics. Knowing what your platform is doing is vital. You need to have this information in a, in the, in a very well-defined place where you can immediately access it and you can go through it and correlate events coming from different components. If you don't do that, you are going to spend so much time going around and trying to find the information you're looking for. Um, keep in mind, what, uh, when you design your log collection system, um, what might work for 100 VMs will probably not work for 5,000. 
So make sure that you build it in such a way that you can swap in and swap out components quickly. Um, and eventually also run them in parallel because that's allow, that allows you actually to try out stuff without breaking your current capabilities. Also one um, funny bit, don't share your monitoring system with your users because otherwise you, you kind of risk losing visibility when you probably need it the most. Uh, this actually happened uh, to us once, so it's, don't try that. Um, another important thing to notice is that when you reach these sizes, the, when you reach this scale, things fail all the time. Assuming in your uh, design or in your components that things are going to work is a mistake. It's a mistake at uh, any level because it's going to come and, and bite you uh, when, again, at the worst possible time normally. Um, as an example, we had this log pipeline that um, was uh, built with the assumption that logs had not to be lost under any circumstances. But then what happens if some of the components at the end of the pipeline actually start misbehaving or slowing down? Then actually this ripples through everywhere and eventually you're going to have problems even on, uh, on your application. Uh, so we have uh, had this uh, deployment running for five years. It has served us very well. Uh, now it sounded kind of, we had many problems. There have been problems, but there have been many success stories and actually it provided a tremendous value. Um, but we realized last year that we had to catch up with upstream. It was not a, question of whether we should do it or just that we had to do it sooner or later. And uh, now Ronnie is going to explain a little bit of how we actually do this in vitro. Okay. So uh, once we started our journey for the second version of the deployment, we had to decide like the first thing uh, for the infrastructure part. Uh, provisioning part, how I'll be delivering the internal software, tools, and other things. Uh, obviously, with the upstream, we chose Bosch for the provisioning because we want to stick with the upstream for that. We use Concourse for delivering our internal tools. Uh, on the infrastructure level, uh, like uh, as most of the Cloud Foundry deployments, they're using a single deployment for deploying Cloud Foundry. We are actually uh, we have divided our deployment uh, like partially on vSphere and uh, on the OpenStack at the same time. The reason for this is uh, back then uh, we had some limitations on our OpenStack deployment where uh, our cinder was uh, not giving a proper support with the, uh, our Bosch APIs. Uh, until a few days back when we have this functionality working properly on the OpenStack. So, we are probably thinking of moving all the components uh, on the open stack. So uh, on, when I say living on the multiple clouds, it's actually deploying a single CF on two different uh, infrastructure. We have a, 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 a Bosch director which has the VMware CPI, which is responsible for provisioning the persistent components of the Cloud Foundry like NFS, Postgres, HCD, and uh, our other uh, internal tools, whereas it is also responsible for deploying the OpenStack uh, Bosch director, which then is responsible for uh, provisioning the stateless components of the Cloud Foundry on top of OpenStack. So uh, it's, it's easy to uh, provision the Cloud Foundry with a single manifest, but uh, in our case, we have to make some changes to actually create two intermediate manifests for uh, each of the infrastructure. So we target them uh, like individually while sharing the properties between them and deploying the persistent components followed by deploying the stateless components. Uh, okay, so with the, pro with the previous version of our deployment, we had uh, three different deployments like most of the people do. They have dev, they have stage, they have prod. But for a team of seven people, it was too much. The overhead was uh, high to actually manage three different deployments. So 
we came up with this thing and uh, we, act we are actually giving our internal users three different logical environments uh, within a same, uh, within a single Cloud Foundry deployment. How we achieve this, we are actually uh, using three different uh, DA groups and three different router groups, which are responsible for uh, catering the uh, traffic for each of the applications. The elastic pools are still uh, on roadmap. They, are, they will be coming up very soon. But then uh, we had to come up with something. So what we did was we call it a stack hack. Uh, there's a property for the root FS itself where on the DA you can uh, change the name of the stack itself and when you have to push an application you can mention this stack to put your application on a particular DA uh, supporting that stack. So we created these uh, DA pools on three different uh, networks having the stack as development, staging and production. So when a user has to put an uh, application on dev, he has to put uh, just an uh, extra uh, property in his application manifest, uh, the stack as dev, stage, or prod. And accordingly, the application will end up on that particular DA. Uh, this part, this uh, provides the pro uh, provisioning DAs on three different uh, networks, provides isolation and both like on the security and the network isolation. Uh, after this thing, uh, this is like just the overview how we actually deploy our whole uh, platform, what all components are in there. So with the previous version, like Carlo mentioned, we forked the upstream version, which was a bad idea, and we won't be doing that again. So we sync up with the upstream for uh, the upstream Bosch releases, whereas for the internal Bosch releases, like for some of our logging and uh, metrics pipeline, we have our internal Bosch releases and some of the user-facing user facing, uh, Cloud Foundry plugins. We use Concourse for shipping uh, these uh, internal uh, releases. Uh, when we start uh, deploying on, not on the production, but on the pre-production environment, it's always good to uh, like analyze the behavior of all your components. So we uh, like collect all of the uh, metrics as much as possible. And during the deployment, we uh, like check the behavior, the pattern of the graphs for pretty much all the components to check their behavior. Uh, followed by a uh, server spec, which is run for run using the Bosch errands for individual components. Individual components can work uh, like very fine as they are expected, but few times the functional integration between two different components can break, even when both the components are working uh, fine. Uh, so there, here we bring uh, the infra tester for. Uh, checking our subsystems, which is again the Bosch Iran jobs for checking the communication between uh, like our APIs or our internal tools, uh, followed by the acceptance and smoke test on our pre-prod environment to check the uptime for the user-facing functionalities and how uh, our platform will perform in case of failures and disaster. Uh, over here, Carlo will brief you more about the other features of the next version platform. So we, um, we put a lot of care into designing a new uh, log aggregation and collection pipeline uh, that, uh, whose primary goal was to completely decouple uh, the producers from the consumers. Um, so we have every single uh, event log metric that is generated by any of the VMs that we deploy, and we deploy all of them with Bosch. Um, we send to Kafka using, well, for syslog, we use uh, the um, uh, OMKafka plugin for collect the write Kafka, et cetera, et cetera. For the application logs and the application metrics, we wrote a component that pulls from the firehose and sends to a per application topic on Kafka. And uh, on this side, um, on the right side of the slide, we have all the, the consumers. We archive logs on blob storage um, using Secor. Uh, we have a ELK stack and um, 
uh, InfluxDB Grafana stack for uh, logging and monitoring internally to, for operation purposes, um, just for our team. We use Riemann for alerting and the complex event processing. Um, we, all of these components had to be able to scale. Uh, this was one like, requirement that we set. And uh, even some components like Riemann that are not naturally able to scale because they are, okay, they're fully stateless in this case, but you need to have sometimes stateful metric, a stateful events to monitor. So it's important that the event for a single specific um, component that you're monitoring always end up in the right Riemann that is um, tasked with monitoring that specific component. So what we came up with is actually a pretty clever solution to like uh, redirect uh, the, um, the matrix uh, to the proper Riemann by using Kafka uh, message IDs and, 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 the part, and the natural partitioning that is available in Kafka. Um, another thing that we set out to do is make sure that we really monitor everything that can move. Um, we collect metrics at all levels, uh, starting from the system, um, obvious stuff. Uh, every component, both CF components as well as any other of the other components, if you have Java components, just pull everything from JMX. Um, if you have NGNX, just pull everything from uh, the monitoring uh, endpoint of, G of NGNX, and so on and so forth. We monitor all this, uh, the, the um, systems we depend on as well to uh, be able to quickly isolate where a problem can be originating from. For example, we had issues uh, in the last years with DNS. Well, at a certain point, our DNS system started responding erratically. Um, and uh, the only way we, could have been, we would have been able to catch that fast is if we were monitoring that DNS system for wrong answers. So we actually set out to make sure that we know this in advance so we can quickly pinpoint the source of a problem. And then we also run, um, we capture end-to-end -end metrics that um, capture the behavior of, of more than one system, both from a passive point of view. So for example, just capture, for example, the latency of request to a particular application, that's easy. But then also capture um, events that we trigger and that we know should take a certain amount of time and make sure that we keep that amount of time constant. So for example, we have this job that runs every five minutes that pushes application to all the environments and we know for sure that that number should be constant within 10 seconds mostly because the application is always the same. So it, this number shouldn't change either like um, uh, transiently or on the long term. Um, we build in V2 all, the, um, uh, all of our uh, Rakuten specific features on top of uh, Cloud Foundry. We basically have nothing on the side. Um, some of these uh, will be made open source soon. For example, the log access, because we think there is actually value in that for the community. Some others are specific, so, specific, so specific to Rakuten that basically it makes no sense. But we can talk if, if you're interested. Um, Moving forward, what we are planning to do next, well, after, as soon as we finish the migration of our users from uh, our current deployment to the new deployment, we are going to target Azure for, because we need to enable, this is actually one of our requirements, burst to cloud scenarios. Um, we, uh, well, this is the first scenario. Actually, we also have others. Uh, um, better reliability so that we have like another data center to fall back into and then eventually better latency and performance for our users. Um, we need to integrate all the service provider that Azure first and um, OpenStack, we have an internal OpenStack team that is working on Troll. Uh, we need to integrate that into, to provide these services to our users. Um, we want to provide HTTP2 um, termination uh, in our initial phase until HTTP2 is actually fully supported everywhere um, so that uh, people get, uh, application gets uh, immediately the benefits of HTTP2 without, uh, well, part of the benefits. Obviously something is, uh, requires support from the application, but part of the benefits should be available immediately by just enabling that on the reverse proxy. Um, we are looking into um, certificate auto-provisioning, meaning um, users can actually 
uh, push their cer certificate and have it installed everywhere on the load balancer for SSL termination to be done automatically. Eventually, we want to do let's encrypt uh, integration so that uh, even if you don't have a proper certificate, we actually create one real certificate for you and even testing is it works seamlessly. Um, autoscaling is not uh, just the application autoscaling uh, side, it's actually the VM autoscaling side. That's what we are mostly interested in because it actually allows us to lower our workload and that's one of our uh, long-term goals. We want to be able to scale this up as much as possible without increasing the workload on the team uh, because the team cannot scale that much. It's not that easy to find people that can work on these things. And then eventually when elastic clusters are going to be available, we are going to look into how to make this thing work across multiple data centers so that users can just push their application once, um, have it deployed on multiple data centers, and uh, via integration with uh, the global load balancer that we have in Rakuten and eventually also in Azure or whatever we're going to use, um, have the traffic steered to the right data center uh, just uh, automatically. That's a little bit of what we are planning to do. There is something that we are experiencing uh, in our contributions um, to, with, to the platform uh, that would be very nice to have some feedback from, like all of you guys if you want, and from the, the uh, foundation. Yeah. Uh, it is, well, mostly some of the things uh, rely on uh, missing documentation. Like there are some uh, conventions that are not really well documented and, uh, and this causes problems like when you open a PR because obviously they will complain. Um, mo many of the jobs are not really designed for colocation. Actually, they explicitly warn you that they don't care. Uh, so it's uh, knowing at least how to make things on your side work nicely with the other components would be, on the long term, would be a very good. Um, what we often find lacking on, uh, on the Bosch side is the inability to know exactly which VMs you're going to redeploy before you actually try to deploy. Um, and also the ability to have like templates, the preview of the templates rendered that would simplify the job of some of the, the guys on the team. Uh, then there is one big um, complaint that we get from our users and that's basically that uh, logs are not just normally single lines. And, um, and knowing that you are losing logs, it's okay. It should, it should be the minimum. It's okay to lose logs, but you should at least know that you are losing logs. Um, and then we have internal use cases that would uh, benefit greatly from having a way to actually hook into the API of the cloud controller and to perform complex validation and, and complex authorization of certain um, operations. So that's it. We kind of overrun by a little bit our time. If you have any questions, you can either ask us now or you can catch up later, anytime. Thank you.